Hi, John. As you know, we are PhD students involved in the Mirror project. This interview will be part of the Mirror newsletter that will be published in September. We are looking forward to knowing more about your research experience and your thoughts and ideas related to clinical research nowadays. Excellent. I look forward to it. The interview is divided into different parts personality and background, thinking, methods in research on research, improving science, and finally, advice for future. So let's start with the first question. Yes? Okay. Perfect. So in the 2015 BMJ editorial, you define yourself as in compromise gentle maniac. Why and how does your personality influence the way you conduct research? I think that that was a, a tongue-in-cheek uh, statement, uh, trying to use three words according to what was recommended. Okay. <laughs> I, can, I can only say that um, uh, I'm trying to conduct research in a way that I enjoy it and that I try to learn as much as possible from my colleagues. So uh, maybe I'm uh, a maniac in terms of uh, not uh, uh, settling in uh, doing less. I'm, I'm always struggling to do more and I'm not sure whether that's good or bad but I, I really try to get maximal enjoyment. I try to be gentle because most of the uh, issues about bias and uh, issues of uh, transparency and uh, quality can get people upset when uh, you find out that there's many biases or that quality is horrible or that there's no transparency. So it's important to focus on the scientific issues rather than try to convert those into personal problems uh, or deficiencies. And I'm compromising, I think that uh, practically when you're dealing with science and the scientific method, you want to have no compromise in terms of uh, how strictly you follow the scientific method and how rigorous you want to be about it and uh, don't compromise with uh, anything less than that. So uh, maybe just an arrogant statement, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, and uh, what was your main motivation to purchase a career in the field of evidence-based medicine? Can you attribute your choice to a certain episode, such as a meeting with a specific person? I think that uh, life uh, and life choices and career choices are not randomized experiments. Uh, so it's not very easy to identify a particular intervention or occurrence uh, that uh, uh, had a clear causal effect. I think that it's an issue of what you come across uh, in, in your life and what type of, of exposures you have. Probably the tipping point for me was uh, about 25 years ago when I, I met uh, the late Tom Chalmers who was uh, a very charismatic personality. At, at that time he had published a paper on cumulative meta-analysis with uh, Joe Lau and uh, I met uh, Joe and Tom and um, uh, it was the same year that um, evidence-based medicine was uh, uh, coined as a term and more widely used uh, at McMaster, uh, the Cochrane collaboration was being launched. There was a lot of interest about uh, uh, moving in that direction and, and I found all of that really fascinating. So if you are asking for a single tipping point, I think that uh, that would be right then. But as I say, uh, there's probably some oversimplification here and clearly there's always some recall bias when we're trying to explain uh, why we did something. Okay, thank you. You were born in New York City, but raised in Athens. What brought you back to New York? <clears throat> so, I'm not sure that uh, I would say that uh, something brought me back to New York because uh, I, I have never lived for a long period of time in New York per se, uh, other than uh, when I was born. Uh, but I always love going back to New York and uh, uh, just stroll in Manhattan. It's, uh, it's a beautiful 
uh, city and uh, very inspiring to, to do so. I think that uh, I have ping-ponged in my life between uh, Europe and uh, the U.S. Uh, and uh, initially it was East Coast, now it is West Coast. I moved to Stanford seven years ago and um, I think that it's a very exciting environment, uh, very open to new high-risk ideas uh, that most of them fail. Uh, probably most, if not all, of my ideas fail, but that's fine. <laughs> it's uh, it's perfectly reasonable to to try and fail. Uh, it's um, I think that increasingly I see myself as both split between different continents, but but also unified in that science and evidence and um, uh, humanity uh, has no boundaries. It's uh, I think world citizenship that we're talking about when it comes to to science, evidence, and humanity. Okay. You were an essential part of the creation of metrics in, in 2014. Today, how satisfied are you with the impact of metrics? And how does it compare to what you hoped for? So Metrix uh, was launched indeed um, about three years ago and uh, when we started, uh, when we joined forces, me and uh, Steve Goodman and uh, several other colleagues, uh, uh, we thought that the time was ripe to put together a connector hub and an overarching effort on research on research, on, on studying research practices and, and ways to improve them and improve efficiency, transparency, reproducibility in uh, research with, with a primary focus on biomedicine but also uh, with ramifications for other fields that face similar challenges and also with the uh, influx of ideas and concepts from other fields that may have thought about some of the problems and they may have come up with some particular solutions already. I think that when we got started, we had a pretty ambitious program uh, of changing the world. And uh, I have to say that three years later, uh, probably our ambition has just increased further. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure that uh, it would be objective for me to uh, judge my own efforts and my own center. It, it, it may be a bit presumptuous, but clearly, we have seen over these three years uh, far more people being sensitized about these issues both in science and other stakeholders related to science and evidence. Uh, lots of very interesting ideas floated, um, many of them uh, supported with evidence, others being very speculative. And I, I think that it would have been very difficult to imagine three years ago, even though it's not a long time ago, all of these possibilities that have emerged nowadays. I, th I think that we are at a crossroads where there's a lot of possibilities about improving research practices and improving uh, scientific methods and transparency and reproducibility. And almost every week I see something new and there's new opportunities to, to brainstorm and join forces with talented colleagues around the world in helping shape and evolve that agenda. So. Uh, I think that probably I have seen more action than I would even have hoped, even though we were very ambitious even at the out front. In the BMJ editorial, you said that your best career move was switching from bench research to evidence-based uh, based medicine and research methods. Why? And how could you encourage any bench researcher who read the sentence to keep on working ambitiously? I think that uh, I have enjoyed practically all types of research that I have done. So I, I have done research that would be categorized as bench research. I have uh, uh, done research that would be categorized as clinical research, as evidence-based research, as uh, both uh, theory and uh, applied uh, uh, solo uh, versus collaborative versus large-scale consortia. 
uh, and uh, also quantitative mathematical statistical versus uh, uh, more applied subject matter. I think that it's important to try to learn from all our research experiences and I, I really feel privileged to have had the opportunity to be exposed to different opportunities to uh, to do research and to, to work with wonderful colleagues in, in all of these areas. I believe that my uh, shift to more evidence-based medicine and research methods topics uh, uh, was beneficial because it, it allowed me to be exposed to some questions that are, are more generic. Uh, they may have more impact across multiple fields rather than uh, a focused set of questions that is more characteristic of uh, most of uh, bench science. But this doesn't mean that I, I think that there's uh, research that uh, uh, should be discredited or credited just because of uh, what the questions are that it tries to address. I think that uh, bench researchers still do fantastic work. They have lots of challenges. I think that many of the questions that we are trying to address on research methods are highly pertinent to bench research and the boundaries between disciplines are are very blurred at the moment. I, th I think that some of the, the greatest contributions in bench research may come from people who are theorists or are working with uh, new approaches to data or with, uh, with new statistical tools. Uh, conversely, some of the opportunities that arise from new bench methods or new technologies of measurement may inform some very interesting debates about evidence and research methods by offering empirical handles to uh, think about some aspects that would have been unheard of otherwise. So I, I, I think that uh, researchers should enjoy what they do and uh, continue working with, uh, with all the joy and ambition that uh, science can offer them. Thank you, John. Uh, concerning methods in research and research, uh, we would like to, to, to ask you the following question. We all agree that defining quality in research is extremely difficult. Based on your own experience, can you please tell us what research quality means to you? Over the years, I have uh, become very skeptical of the, of the term quality. Uh, it's uh, some sort of a holy grail and uh, if we had a single quality scale or some way to measure quality uh, reliably, reproducibly, uh, unambiguously and consistently, it, it would have been fantastic. We don't really have that. We have different approaches and different tools that look at uh, uh, various aspects of research work that are related eventually to quality. So we have ways to measure and understand uh, risk of bias. We have uh, measures uh, to track reporting of research. We have uh, uh, some ways to try to probe into different biases. A number of years ago, along with David Chevalarias, we published a paper where we mapped 325 different biases in the biomedical literature and I'm sure that our list was uh, incomplete. So research quality is a holy grail. I think that for each type of design and for each type of study you need to ask yourself what are the main issues involved and uh, what are the main threats, what are the main risks to transparency, reproducibility, uh, precision, and many, many other aspects that, that may be field specific. And uh, sometimes, unfortunately, in a non-transparent environment, there's very little that you can say because, for example, much research is not published at all. So if it's not available, how can you even think about judging its quality? And even when it is published, when you see a published paper, this is more like an advertisement. It's just four or five or six pages well, there's a whole universe of action, activity, data collection, speculation, protocol or lack of protocol, analysis, analytical spree or manipulation of data, and heavy interpretation with potentially unbelievable spin 
that goes into that five or six pages published product. So it's a, it's a footprint and quality may not be very transparent uh, when you just see these five or six uh, uh, printed pages. So it's, uh, it's a goal. I, I, I see it as a final goal to produce the perfect quality research, but uh, it, it has to be operationalized to be made tangible in a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In 2015, your colleagues Douglas Altman and David Moore provided four proposals to help improve medical research literature, such as introducing publication officers or developing competencies for editors and peer reviewers. In your opinion, how have these proposals been implemented so far? And what further proposals do you have? So uh, David and uh, Doug have really thought a lot about these issues and, and they have uh, uh, worked uh, uh, for, for a number of years uh, trying to optimize uh, uh, research practices in, in uh, many aspects including reporting and uh, peer review and uh, uh, coming back to the quality term, the, the quality of, of publications. So I, I think that their, their views in the specific PLOS medicine uh, paper are very interesting. Uh, basically, they can be uh, categorized under, under that bigger theme of uh, uh, having people who are knowledgeable, or at least this is how I see it. And, and how do you make people knowledgeable? How do you uh, improve their skills? How do you uh, improve... Uh, their understanding and their ability to come up with uh, with cogent research and write up their protocols and uh, and their papers and and also how do you train other people who are in the chain of the production of evidence like editors and peer reviewers to be knowledgeable and to understand what they're doing and improving research rather than just uh, letting it appear or even sometimes making it worse uh, compared to what was submitted. So uh, we have plenty of evidence that there's plenty of room to improve on all of these fronts. And uh, I, I think that the question is how exactly uh, would that be done? For example, the idea of a publication officer can be operationalized in many different ways. And I, I don't think that you need to have someone who's like a committed publication officer to train people how to write manuscripts. It's, it's a question of how do you improve the, the standards of education and training and knowledge for people who are at the core of producing and disseminating research. There's many ideas about how to improve things and uh, both myself and others have written extensively about it. Uh, for example, uh, there's a paper that I wrote uh, in PLOS Medicine in 2014 about um, approaches to increase uh, credibility of research, to make research more true. And uh, I listed 12 families of uh, uh, such possibilities. Uh, they include large-scale collaborative research, adoption of replication culture, replica uh, registration practices, uh, strengthening of sharing of data, protocols, software, materials, and so forth, uh, reproducibility checks and other related practices, uh, finding ways to contain conflicted sponsors and authors, using more appropriate statistical methods, standardizing definitions and analysis, using more stringent thresholds for claiming discoveries or successes, improving study design standards, improving peer review, reporting, and dissemination of research, and uh, much like uh, Doug and uh, David, uh, my last family of uh, proposals was better training of the scientific workforce in methods and statistical literacy. Uh, there's other initiatives. Uh, uh, for example, a few months ago, we published a paper in uh, Nature Human Behavior along with several other colleagues where we have come up with a manifesto for improving reproducible research. And, Again, we go through a number of proposals, many of them in, in these aspects of improving the circle from 
conceiving about an idea until it gets published and disseminated. I think that we will hear more and more such ideas uh, and uh, the, the real question is how many of those can we adopt, how many of those we should prioritize, and how are we going to test which one of those are the best. It may be that my ideas are the worst. I think that uh, some ideas already have very strong empirical support, others are very speculative. Can we map evidence on improving research and research practices, much as we do for drugs and devices in clinical trials, can we do the same for these ideas or for potential interventions? Can, can we test, for example, whether uh, having someone uh, who uh, is being trained to peer review or is trained as an editor, would that improve some particular outcomes? I think this is where the main challenge is and uh, there's some action in trying to test with experimental methods all of these proposals. Thank you, Jan. Interesting. Well, nowadays productivity and efficiency are required from every researcher more than ever. Do you consider that it is possible to teach a new generation of researchers to produce more honest, relevant and quality science if everyone around us talks about being productive and efficient? I think that productivity and efficiency are wonderful. So I, I, I'm not among those who say that uh, we should uh, diminish productivity. And, and clearly, I don't think that it makes sense that we should uh, destroy efficiency. Uh, if anything, when we try to get the best evidence, we try to improve efficiency in, in what we do. Uh, we, we try to get things to be done better, faster, with less cost, with better outcomes. And in science, when we're talking about productivity, I, I'm not in favor of uh, uh, just uh, not publishing, for example. Uh, th that would just promote extreme publication bias. The, the main challenge is whether we can connect productivity and efficiency with transparency, sharing, reproducibility, and uh, real translational potential for improving outcomes, which in terms of uh, health and healthcare, it means life saved and lives with better quality of life. So can we work in a way that uh, these other features are also promoted and still remain efficient and productive, uh, still make progress? but make genuine progress, reproducible progress, transparent progress that can be verified and can go beyond doubt. So it, it's a matter of rewards and incentives largely. If we reward people just to publish more papers and this is it, they will just publish more papers and after some time probably they will start cutting corners to publish yet another paper as quickly as possible even though this paper will not be transparent, will not be shared, for its data or protocols, uh, will not contribute anything to translational potential and will not help any humans. If we add these other dimensions, I think that that would uh, uh, make a difference and, and then we can have the new generation really aligned with promoting these other values that are extremely important. Uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic that we can get this done and I think that uh, the large majority of scientists realize that this is where we need to go. <laughs> With regard to tackling research misconduct, where do you think that resources should be directed? Into educating the researchers from an early career stage via dedicated training or into establishing stricter mechanisms to monitor the quality and conduct of research as it is undertaken? I think that this remains an open question to a large extent and as I mentioned before there's many interventions that can be adopted at very different levels and at very different stages of, uh, of that whole process of producing research results, disseminating them and implementing them. It's, um, it's important to 
understand that some of the proposed interventions may even be harmful. So uh, they have some cost. They, they may also have some adverse effects. Um, to, to give you one example, if, if we say that uh, we want to go down the path of uh, monitoring the quality and the conduct of research as it is undertaken, one option would be to audit everything. Yeah, so in, in every lab uh, and in every laptop or desktop, other than the researcher, we would have an auditor who would be looking at all the calculations, all the experiments, everything that has been done. To, to do this, you need to double the research force. You need to have uh, half of the resources given to that auditor who would be the clone of the researcher. And, and then what? It would sound like a police uh, situation where you have uh, some some crooks who are trying to escape and uh, and cheat and and you have the policemen who are trying to police them it, it, this is not science it's uh, it, it kind of kills completely the joy of science the, the joy of of knowledge of, of doing something altruistically in a communal sense with sharing for the good of humanity or helping people so how can we strike the right balance? I mean, we clearly need to educate. I have no doubt about that. But where exactly do we intervene? Do we intervene just uh, at the end of the chain when uh, uh, everybody has uh, uh, learned the, the wrong lessons? Do we educate very early? And what is early? Uh, early could be at the level of uh, elementary school. Uh, we have evidence now that uh, uh, children can learn about uh, controlled trials. You know, maybe, maybe they should learn about randomized trials when they're six or seven or eight years old. And uh, maybe if we wait for later to teach them experimental principles, it's too late. Uh, so these are open questions, and I, I don't pretend to have the, the final answer, but we have to be very careful about what we propose and how we, we verify that what we propose will do more uh, good rather than harm. <laughs> okay, our final question uh, is more for, for the Mirror Fellows for us. What career advice would you give to early stage researchers as the Mirror Fellows? I, I'm not sure that I'm good at giving advice uh, because uh, I may well be wrong <laughs> in my <laughs> suggestions, but Probably I would not be wrong if I were to say that um, research is uh, is very difficult. It's very demanding. It's uh, it's a lifelong enterprise. Uh, it 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 takes a lot of effort and a lot of commitment. So whatever you do, make sure that you do something that you're very excited about, and that you really feel that it it gives you joy and and mental and other satisfaction to to keep going. I think that uh, science is the best thing that has happened to humans. Uh, trying to do scientific research, even more so trying to improve uh, scientific research, ha can have major repercussions for, for humans and for humanity at large. So it's a very noble goal. Try to be inspired by that. Uh, don't quit because of difficulty. Uh, it's almost certain that you will be rejected again and again and again. It has happened to me probably over a thousand times in terms of how many rejections I got and I still get rejected on a daily basis probably, probably get more rejections now than in my early career. So you, you need to be excited about what you do and uh, don't quit no matter what the adversity is. John, thank you very much for your time. It was great to hear your opinions and ideas about all these relevant topics. Thank you again.